already delegated that. <laughs> Claire and Olivia are going to uh, take notes. And actually, I'm perfectly happy to help do the, get the, the presentation. So I don't know, maybe what we could do is look at the questions that we were presented with and just talk around them for trying to identify how we want to use these questions to frame our response today and then tomorrow morning we can we can try and make this a coherent presentation. I, I mean I unless we, obviously, we haven't had time to rehearse this. Uh, no. <laughs> Planning uh, it. So, I don't know. Uh, Shouldn't we start with question three? Yeah, yeah that, that was yeah, important. Yeah, And we yeah, yeah, yeah. discussion for one, two, and four. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's fine. Since you, since you feel strongly about it, why don't you tell us what your thoughts are? And we'll go for it. Are you going to talk about aerosols or chemistry or both? Both. both. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we, one of the things we can do also is to identify the places where the chemistry and the aerosols interact with each other and where these components are interacting with the other groups. And for example, with respect to the time scales, it seems to me like these issues of changing vegetation and land use are things which will have an influence on aerosol distributions, for example. And, and obviously... And we're, yeah. And will influence the time scales over which the problems are important. That's true for pre-industrial to present day as well as the future. I think you made a good point as well that aerosols probably the atmospheric ozone will probably need it to reproduce the climate change of the 20th century. So it would be a bit strange to have them for the yeah. industry of the prison. They are not for the future. It would make the experimental design fairly difficult. Or vice versa. I mean, I'm a little concerned about constructing very elaborate scenarios for the future that are, have no consistent, I mean, where there's no restrictions on you know, the rest of the time, the record. But this is. I think we, we should mention it maybe for here, but maybe it also belongs in this other brief. I think the, one of the questions we want to see is that, for example, if you look at the aerosols, if you want to reproduce a change in temperature and so on, do you need detailed aerosol or do you just need optical depth and that's it? And stuff like that. And it's maybe. Why it's important? Do we need, I mean, a detailed aerosol scheme? For aerosol, I don't know, so that's why I ask the question. Or do we just, if we just have one or two parameters, that would be enough for the climate models? Well, I think if you want to start looking at the indirect effect, having just bulk aerosols makes it difficult. And you have to make pretty serious assumptions on size distribution. Yeah, and I think it's what we need to identify. Uh, we need the side distribution. Bulk aerosol is fine for the direct effect, but maybe okay, not that good for the indirect effect. Although you could do something, obviously. Yeah. You can, yes. Um, one of the things that Dave Bryant and I were talking about over the coffee was what is actually going to be practical for them. I mean, I'm assuming that part of this, or that this conversation is actually sort of helping to guide the way that the ex experiments might be run for the next IPCC. And, uh, 
in that context, what they were saying over coffee was, it's, it's quite likely that many of the models or the experiments which would be done for IPCC will be much simpler than the, than the capabilities that we may have in place in the most advanced models and that we may again be in the situation of looking at the time variation of only some of the, the aerosol components and in fact maybe constraining the rest of them by uh, specifying concentrations versus <laughs> specifying yeah, emissions. And it'll be interesting to see whether a, is there an AR5 and if so, how stringent the requirements for the individual runs that the modeling groups are given is. So we recognize that for the past century, people were given degrees of freedom for a lot of the forces, especially the more exotic aerosols. When it comes to the future, is that going to be the case again? And are more groups going to want to put in black carbon, organic aerosols, things of that nature? And are they going to choose their own paths in terms of what they're putting in? Because as we, hope, as we heard, there doesn't seem to be any attempt uh, from the scenario standpoint to be providing emissions for these other aerosols. So now that groups are sort of revving up the capability to have these aerosols in their model, they're going to be satisfied to do future runs and not put them in. Or are they going to make up something themselves to put in? Or is some instruction going to be given them? I don't think we should expect a lot of guidance and instruction on how to set up the, the runs. That's my feeling. It doesn't seem to be... But isn't that part of what, I mean, having... My job in the past has been readying a model for IPCC, not in running an IPCC, not in analyzing an IPCC. So what I don't know is, <coughs> are we going to, I mean, are we going to insist that they provide us with scenarios for the emissions of VOCs? Well, but isn't this where your, part? where your historical part is very important? Because let's say you put in some new aerosols and you want to know whether your treatment of those is acceptable in some sense. How do you do that? Uh, and, or if you have no way of knowing this, and you have no, no constraints on it, wouldn't you be better off not to do it? Uh, I mean, I think those may be questions that would have to be posed in some way. Uh, I, I think I would ask the question again, just like what you said. If you put ourselves in, how are you going to run the 20th century runs to verify against the known climate? And what inputs do you need there? I would say then you need those inputs over the next 100 years or else that is inconsistent, I would, I would say. There were very little guidance on how to set up the sulfate aerosols in AR4. Different groups have done differently. Do you, expect, do you expect it's going to improve with AR5? I think there are, there are more and more efforts in trying, there are a few efforts in trying to provide emissions of aerosols and uh, ozone precursors for the 20th century. Um, I mean, so far there is only basically one, but there are several going on, and there's probably a lot of uh, differences. Uh, be, between between those emission scenarios, but but it's something that we can we can we can analyze, and we do have observations of I mean, if nothing else, optical depth over a wide variety of aeronet sites, and we have observations of concentrations, of, of especially over the U.S. and um, in Europe, that can constrain some of the information that are uh, used that are provided by aerosol uh, models. I mean, that's very valuable, but um, for instance, predicting, I don't, I'm, I'm not an aerosol person, but I, I know, for instance, DMS, there are people who are trying to provide ways of representing DMS fluxes. Mm -hmm. um, but is that well enough constrained to ensure that you can produce realistic
realistic concentrations of CMS, for instance, which is one of the big important precursors for I think it's probably, I would guess, it's probably better constrained than the volcanic forcing from Pinatubo. Um, I mean, there, there are evaluations, uh, global maps of DMS flux, just, just to use your, your example, that we can use to constrain biogeochemistry models that have interactive biogeochemistry in the ocean from which we can deduce DMS fluxes. Are, are so, these maps, I mean, I haven't looked at it in a few years, but when I had looked at it, there were quite strong differences in some regions in terms of the magnitude of DMS. It's about the factor it's of two and seven yeah, That's right. Well, I don't think that has decreased pretty strongly recently. coastal. But we could yeah. live with that. Yeah. But this has, been, yeah. from this has been done, I think yeah. there have been some comparisons, but if you want to look at emission of the, of the past, I don't think many people have really compared what is available. Up to now, it has not really been done. On uh, if you talk DMS over the past, I don't know what it was, but if you look at black carbon emissions over the past and uh, CO, NOx, and stuff like that, not people have compared that over the last 20, 30 years, but not really back before the pre-industrial. And it's something that we can easily do over the next year. Before, for, for in the year, we can do that. But this, I don't think it has been done systematically, I would say. And there are very few data, so few data and few observations data. that we can use yeah, to constrain that those, those estimates. Yeah, that we can constrain that, but... The fire history yeah. also is something uh, to consider. Yeah, fire yeah. history. Yeah. Fire history. Yeah. What we have so far seems to be quite different from what the uh, ecosystem people are coming from. Apparently, there are two, uh, at least for fires, I know two. The one we heard yesterday, there has been a paper where you were involved in, at least. And I don't think this has been compared either. So we really need to do really evaluation of, of this work because it has never been done in the framework of IPCC, at least. So that's it. We're sort of drifting to the uh, uh, experimental design here. Yeah, we are. Because what the other thing I was yeah. thinking about is jumping to question one here. What is ready to go in the AOGCM? Yeah. So my feeling is, at the moment, we might actually be in a situation where the models have more capability than we're cap that we're uh, we are able to um, evaluate even t t today with respect to uh, current scenarios or or reproducing a historical record. There, well, okay, so uh, John Seinfeld was mentioned in that talk about the 180 tracers, and we are working with him, and he's running an inner version of our model. So you might say that capability exists, except that it takes forever to run it. So does it really exist, this capability, when you talk about a climate change experiment, or just for little snapshots and understanding? I, for understanding and helping to understand, I think the capability exists. Whether it exists to really run climate change experiments, I think this journey is still on. So you have, in effect, a lot of capability for different things. You, one could, in principle, because many people have done it, run with a lot of aerosol uh, species and treat them in ways that are physically realistic maybe even have ways of specifying emissions and things like that. But you can, by the same token, run with a lot of chemical species. Stratospheric chemistry models nowadays typically have about 50, 50 or so species uh, and can produce pretty realistic representations of the chemistry. Some of these can even have extend down into the troposphere and do a fair job. Combining those two may well be an overwhelming not viable task for climate simulations. So maybe one question is, are there, how do we use these things judiciously to address questions that are, are important for climate? What are, you know, how, how are those, what are those questions and how does one combine these? these but I think it goes back to question three. What do you want to answer? Right. Uh, I mean, most likely, I mean, I, and again, I hate to, hate to say that, but for purely climate questions, most likely we don't need interactive chemistry. But that be my rough guess. Yeah. For the tropospheric, 
tropospheric forcing. If you start looking into the stratosphere, then it would be good to have interactive chemistry because the feedbacks are much stronger. But for the troposphere, most likely. I mean, I'm Just we're, we're troposphere goes that. on when you come back down to it, and maybe methane a little bit. And maybe methane a little bit. And, and you, can, you can play the game that um, Guy was talking about of trying to bring in some of the feedbacks in a slightly parameterized way. And so it there could, there could be something like that. But for just purely climate question, we might well, not need, uh, uh, need, need but that. There, in fact, you could address that question by designing experiments in which you ask, you know, here's a model that has right. all of this capability, let's do some runs with it, That's right. in which we degrade it in various rational ways. That's right. To ask, answer the question. I have two simulations running at this Okay, moment. well that's good. I mean, because that's the kind of question to just that, that can actually Spark has proposed this in the concept text of how important in resolving the stratosphere for climate models by running full-blown models and, and degrading them in ways that will enable you to address the issue of how many, what are the fundamental processes for what type of Mm -hmm. So that might be a strategy that could be developed in some mm -hmm. way. What was the answer? Well, we haven't got the answer yet. Ah, yeah, okay. So it's still an ongoing world. Like mm -hmm. yeah. um, the problem with the third sweep chemistry is that it's even more expensive than the true sweep chemistry, at least in our model. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's right. Yeah. Because you've got to increase the vertical resolution, uh, you've got to reduce the time step for stability problems. <laughs> for stability, for dynamical stability, or for That's chemical of the resolution? chemical solutions? Uh, mm -hmm. the dynamics. <laughs> well, the wind speeds are certainly higher there, but I mean, we have found ways that to, to, to avoid the st stability restrictions. So it's not always it's not a, that that yeah. one's not no, not uniform, but it, it nevertheless it's still it, everything else you said is absolutely. But is it because some of the solvents are very stiff? Or? Well, no, that, yeah. that, that two things actually. Yeah. Because you increase the vertical resolution, for some reason we've got to decrease the time step of the dynamics. Uh, we are working on a way around that, but it's not clear whether we can do it or not. And then because of the stiffness of the equation, we've got to uh, choose a solver which is more, more expensive than for the troposphere. So that what sort of would the cost? Yeah, but those are maybe practical questions that various people may have ways around. But, but I guess the, you know, the question I was posing is, you know, how important is it to do all of the chemistry in the stratosphere all the time, for example? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not very important. It may be important if you're worried about ozone. It may be important for certain problems. But you could address the question of how important it is for the climate at the surface. And maybe it's not very important. But do we know the answer to that? Mm. I don't know. We don't. Right. Not a clear answer. So the wise job for us was out of a job. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask the, the. You've just said that about chemistry. Can you can you possibly say that uh, the same about aerosols or not? I mean, I get the impression that you have to have these aerosols in, that's and you can't do. And you can't right, do so, so the history could be, it's clear you need them. You need yeah. them. In terms of feedbacks, it's not clear. The feedbacks aren't very strong. I mean, the wind speed may change, and that may change DMS and CSO emissions. That's not a very strong feedback. Just its impact on climate, and if it reduces the climate change, then all the climate feedbacks get reduced. So you need to, the aerosols are needed for their climate impact. Right. Okay. Surely, if you put in things like yeah. black carbon or an indirect effect in, the temperature increase will be less than if you don't have them, and yeah. therefore the rate of the other feedbacks will be different. Is that not right? Yeah. The, the more you look in the future, the less true that is. Yeah, but that's an that's interesting point because then that raises the question of what's the time scale right. for, that we're worried about. I mean, you know, typical northern western hemisphere governments don't live for 50 years, they live, and they plan for 25 or 30 years or something like that. 
And in that context, the what you need to do may be different from what you'd have to do to stabilize a certain region of forcing, for example. Um, it, it, it may be a different set of questions. I mean, even for the historical record, as uh, Phil presented, there is there is the big uncertainty on the organic aerosols, on both, both what what they do radiatively and how much there is. To do those, it's unclear we can do it without chemistry. Well, can I rephrase it? I mean, we can. Parameterize. We can produce organic aerosols without full chemistry. Whether we, whether the answers that come out have any meaning whatsoever is another is another That's question. Right. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. So. Yes. Yeah. I guess one of the things that I think about with respect to this is. So, I I stated that I thought half the models had bulk formulations, and I thought the other half had better than bulk formulations, and then I I stated. But the only things that I was aware of that were varied in the last assessment were black carbon and sulfate. And the question, uh, that I, uh, one of the things that I think we could, I, I think it's quite likely that most major modeling centers today could do more than black carbon and sulfate with, with their parameterizations today. And, the, and so we could do future scenarios of organic aerosols or, and, or the historical record for organic aerosols. We could allow sea salt and dust to respond to climate change. Should we be doing those calculations today with the, with the formulations that we have today, not the formulations that we might have six months, two years, or five years down the road? Should we, I mean, does, does that seem like a meaningful question to, to the other well, groups? Well, when you here? say do the simulations, uh, clearly, it, what do you mean by do them? If you're doing them for the sake of understanding how well you can do them, and you want to have them improve five years downstream, you certainly have to do them. Perfect. Then. I understand. That. But if you if you mean do them, you know I didn't mean seriously it the way you just said. as as part of a high confidence climate change prediction. I, I think what some groups, for example, what GIS is doing is it's doing rounds with all of those guys in there. Then it's doing rounds without the less certain guys in there. And just to say, hey, these less certain guys, this is what they're doing. To quantify the effects as we stand right now, in terms of our understanding. Uh, without necessarily coming to any conclusion as to whether it's right or not. So it's being done to give you an order of magnitude, quantitative perception of what these guys are doing with our current understanding. Okay, so now I'm going to rephrase the sort of motivation for the meeting. If Jerry is here, he might help us. but. It seems to me like what we're, the reason we're having this dialogue is obviously the centers, GIS and NCAR, etc., are going to go their own path and they are going to investigate the problems you articulated. But what we should be thinking about also is we're looking, what I think we're looking for here is a way of helping the community as a whole move forward in a coherent uh, fashion. And so we're trying to provide some framework for which we can all work work together on an agreed upon set of important problems. And so the question is, do we want to try and have the evaluation of dust in a changing climate be done in the context of an international effort, or do we want to do it one, one group at a time? And if we want to do it as an international, uh, uh, with, in a kind of agreed upon protocol internationally, then maybe maybe it does go on the list for whether we want to tackle it as a, as a group in the next six months, two years, or five years. Am I framing the question correctly here? Okay. So I think, isn't it also that if you do that, then you, you need to say, do we use a common projection for dust over the next... Uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that, that would be uh, internal to the model. Yeah, yeah dust is a, dust is a, I, I chose an unfortunate one. Let's choose one that's easy. How about organic aerosols? Oh, but dust is a good example because it's something, you, it's internally well, there. Maybe we got to talk about both of them. Let's say that. But yeah, They're all so for dust we don't have any, we don't have any tunable, I mean, well, oh we do. 
but we could agree on land use changes. We could agree on vegetation types or, you know, yeah, for the historical or the future. Right? So the, in, in that sense, we could all do dust the same way. No, the dust no. is going to respond to how your vegetation... Yeah, sure, but we could all use the same, we could all use the same land, uh, plant functional types, and land types, vegetation types, we could all use, you know, if we wanted... I think that's, I think that's no. asking too much. Let's no. just do it. Black carbon or something. I, I just looked, by the way, at uh, the IPCC table on the black carbon radiative forcing for the past century. And amongst the different models they show, it differs between 0.16 and 0.64 watts per meter squared. So that's a factor of four difference amongst the models for this past century, given each of them their freedom to do it any way they want, basically. And my guess is that if we give the models have that same freedom in the future, you're going to get that same type of difference in the future. But, I mean, maybe you say that's good because we don't know what's right and what's wrong. Let everybody do what they want and caveat emptor, you know? Um, I don't know. What would constrain that? Probably uh, observations of some sort. Of the emissions? But, but when you say there's that factor four, is there a factor are they all using the same time history? No. Mm -mm. no. There's no, no they're there's just no doing what thing. they wanted. They're just doing what they wanted. Yes. So, <laughs> so is there a factor of four in the time history of the... Well, I think they numbers? probably have, as we were talking about, mm -hmm. different vertical distributions. They may very well have different refractive characteristics they're using. Mm -hmm. um, and different and even their scenario. prescription. I mean, we did the most arbitrary thing possible. We reduced whatever our present day concentrations were to 30% of present day for our 1870 concent concentrations, and then we scaled them by population or something um, between the between present day and pre-industrial. With no changes in the original distribution. That's right. And I think for the future we held them constant. But is it something you did, or is it something that the community decided on? We did. But just... No consensus. There is no consensus. And so maybe we need to do something better than that, right? But maybe maybe consensus at least should be given on some direct, maybe not on exactly use this file, this file, this file, but some, on, I don't know, as you say, that you divide it by that, why? You don't know. You have to well, give a number. The thing that yeah. David and I talked about over coffee was we might want to do, a, you know, I mean, this is where we actually get into the, the in the, in the context of the experimental design, I think we could do much better than we've ever done in the past, if we choose to. We don't. We don't have to let everybody do a free-for-all, where really there's so much freedom that you yeah. can't possibly compare models. I mean, all that you can do is use the spread to tell you that it's something about uncertainty. Right? But the problem is how to achieve some guidance, to design some guidance in this. Because there, is, there has not been, there is no international IPCC-like which, which looks at the past, really. And so, up to now... But it's where Genya could have. Yeah, it's where, where we could. And also what I'm thinking, maybe, as I was talking with some people at lunch about that, is that there is also another body called the Language Transport Convention, who is working on that also. And maybe there could be some exchange of, at least to coordinate the activities, because they will look at the past. And, uh, and it's exactly the same species we are talking here about. They don't look at CO2 and methane, they looked at everything else. And so, but it's something that we have to establish because there is no way of officially talking to these bodies and so on. It's, it's something that we have to start from scratch, I think. And do we have the time to do that? I don't know. <laughs> On question three, I'd like to add one of the topics that could be of interest is air quality. Yeah. Because that's something that is uh, probably will be um, uh, of in interest to more and more uh, people. Any impacts? Any impacts? Sure. The quality can also include effect of ozone and plants. That's right. Number of things that we want to look online in the model. Because the ones we do for the climate are used by the other groups, other IPCC groups, I guess. It's the same ones. So if the impact community wants to use that, they need to have some outputs. 
and the uh, outputs are very much chemistry dependent. Also, when you we say troposphere is not clear, except for the impact. The impact are a lot of chemistry stuff. That's right. Of aerosols, I mean. And some of these impacts sources. you can do offline, but some of the impacts yeah. that you can only do them online in an Earth system model, either because you need an awful lot of data to, to drive the impact model, and, and you can't store all, all this data, or yeah. because uh, the impacts are themselves that put some feedback on the rest of the system. Well, you have a direct CO2 feedback there, ozone to plants. Yeah. This is potentially a, a large feedback. Yeah. So we can't, we're talking about the dabbling of the ozone force. Aerosol and chemistry is the two last thing I want to talk about, <laughs> but uh, uh, for various reasons I'm here. We're <laughs> <laughs> sorry for you. Okay. Um, but I, I understand that the, uh, the modeling group uh, tries to incorporate uh, new processes and try to study and try to you know uh, uh, measure such effects and so on and so forth. And uh, initially, uh, there are many uncertainties. So that uh, in order to do a projection like the study or hind cast like studies, uh, there may be controversial aspects of it. And uh, uh, other processes uh, like uh, atmospheric ocean, couple GCM, or uh, carbon uh, cycle model uh, went through this process uh, by way of doing uh, model intercomparison uh, project. So that is, is there any uh, possibility that the chemistry and the also um, might want to do this yes. kind of thing at the state at this stage? Like uh, I, I think it is uh, natural for most people, mo model groups, to include uh, carbon carbonaceous aerosol and sulfate aerosol and uh, transport it and then uh, give them, giving the emission. They, they are moving toward this way, uh, but. Uh, if we keep saying that okay, this this is not uh, mature, or but at some stage we might want to uh, make some guidelines uh, that the incorporated process are uh, reasonably validated or not. So, so yeah, well, I have some responses. Which is, there has been a group called Aracom, Aracom, which has embarked upon a intercomparison effort for global models, um, but not with, the, well, not with the focus on climate change models. And there is a, a new effort that's the first meeting is next week in Boulder for a very, a very small group of people that's part of either SPARC and IGAC or you could, in the broader context, WCRP and IGPP which is called Atmospheric Chemistry and Climate. And its goal will, one of the goals will be to attempt to try and um, focus on a few specific problems uh, and try and understand the uh, variations across model formulations where the deficiencies are within model components and um, how to uh, perhaps reduce those efficiencies with a specific goal of readying the models for I the next IPCC. Is it an intercomparison inter project? It, it is. It will be an intercomparison project. So, for um, example, he, he mentioned that the, uh, there, there are a considerable uh, variability among the models about yes. the uh, the carbonaceous uh, yeah. yeah. So the, the efforts to try to understand why uh, there are uh, such variations or which, one, which component, is, which factor is dominant in doing this. This kind of uh, approach uh, would be uh, useful yeah. rather than... Mm -hmm. And for a reactive chemistry, for this round of IPCC, there was an effort of some intercomparison of results from, I think, about 20 models. 25. 25? Yeah. And, and all of them except one. All the existing one except one. Yeah. So. And, uh, yeah. and so and some, some of that was just uh, model intercomparison. Some of it was also comparison with observations, um, which are limited. I mean, one has to realize that. But, but, they're, but they're, they exist. And so, th so there is some documentation on the ability of the model 
to reproduce present day conditions for um, some of the reactive gases. And again, the other study, the ERACOM Ara study, was again present day only. There was no future, there was no past. But the one on gases was present and 2030. Okay. And uh, the problem, what I've seen for that, it was funded by the European Commission, and I don't see anything funding like, funded like that for the next few years, I would say. You mean the study, the intercomparison? No, because it was a lot of money to just to put, put all the people together to, for meetings. And what was very difficult is to do a, something like the PCMDI, but for the chemistry. It's what they did. Uh, it's, it's still available, but it was a big effort from the European Commission to do that. And uh, the I don't know if they will continue. ACMC, Atmospheric Chemistry and Climate, that, that, that is building on or starting out with a project with it that was a spark project which is called CCM Val, Chemistry Climate Model Validation, which was originally more, fairly strongly motivated by the ozone assessment process, which takes place every four years and is mandated by the Montreal Protocol. Now of course that that does raise another part of climate and that is the coupling between something like ozone and climate. Um, either the effects of ozone on climate change or for the ozone assessment, perhaps more importantly, the effect of climate change on ozone. That's an important question for things like, and he, he mentioned it yesterday, like ozone recovery. Um, those are all questions that have to be addressed because the Montreal Protocol mandates the assessment process. So that's, that's another type of assessment that, that is relevant to climate change because it's a, it's a climate related assessment. I'm not sure how many groups will run with intratrophospheric ozone for AR5. I suspect very few, if any. But there may have to be some that do in order to address questions that are related to climate change, but not necessarily creators of climate change, but uh, to evaluate impacts of climate change. Take like but since CCNVAL has existed for some time now, it might be also useful to use at least the results from CCNVAL that are currently existing to evaluate what they found in terms of uh, interact if it's useful to have in interactive or not, because they've already evaluated that a bit. And, uh, partly. Partly, yeah, a bit of it, but no, at not, least it could give some... Not in it not wasn't, wasn't the emphasis it of CCNVAL. Right. It hasn't gone that far. And not yet? One, oh. one of the things that is yet to be done, right? That's part of the whole thing. Well, it seems to me that one of the things that I know David's got something to say too, and I won't forget, but we should think about maybe is the focus of ACNC was really going to be on the shorter lived trace constituents. So that means aerosols and ozone, not CO2 and methane. And so that was how we kind of partitioned the problem between this group and that ACNC group. And what we might want to think about also is how how we sort of structure the interaction so that you know it might be possible for this group to delegate certain tasks to A, C, and C, and we could take it. You know, that other group could take some of the responsibility for doing these things. But also, it has to be there are certain things that this group can do, which A, C, and C hasn't got a chance of doing, like producing historical estimates of fires or um, land use change or something like that. So, okay, Dave, you have um, something to say. So, uh, as far as the, we're jumping around here, to get back for a moment to the aerosol into comparison, with respect to what modeling groups did over the past 100 years and understanding why they were different, I think the very first thing, and probably a thing that may well be sufficient, is to just find out what did they use. For example, for black carbon, what magnitudes of black carbon did they use as a function of latitude and altitude and time? Obviously these were input data sets that people used. We should be able to get them. And in terms of one of these CCSP reports, one of the goals we had for the one, the air quality one, which I think is chapter 
happened before, is to see if we could get from the different modeling groups, what did they actually use for the different aerosols? And see ultimately if there can be some convergence as to what ideally people should use. Is there enough data to produce that or not? You definitely think it's an advantage if all the groups use the same? Well, at least as, as compared to some of the scenarios you know, A1B and so on. There was a preferred scenario, maybe people didn't think about it that way, but there was one scenario that everybody used, and then others that people could use. It would be nice if we could come up with that type of thing, a consensus thing, for aerosols for the past and maybe even for the future, so that we could have some model comparisons not based just on different input files. Right. But if you think so, of Aerocom, an awful lot has already been done. There is an Aerocom A experiment where everyone has used its own emission inventories, and an Aerocom B experiment where it's been fixed emission inventories for all of the groups. And I don't think that Aerocom B has shown much less variability or much less diversity in results than Aerocom A. Probably a little bit, but not, not an awful lot. Um, so, do people who run the IPCC ones use the Aerocom emissions mostly? So, the Aerocom emissions came after and they just for pre industrial on the day. But there seems to be a feeling here that if the model disagree, it shouldn't, or if, if, if the aerosol model should disagree, for instance, it should be, shouldn't be included in the IPCC simulation. Is that, is that right? Is that what no. you feel? Or? I don't feel no. that. Then why do we? Then why are we talking so much about it? Well, it seems to be the should disagree. Uh, then, <laughs> the, you know, uh, for example, the cloud water, cloud ice model disagree completely, but uh, by investigating how the, uh, they differ, uh, then uh, the climate sensitivity understanding is promoted. So that the uh, model can disagree, but uh, it is important to investigate the reason why they disagree. Uh, that's the kind of activity uh, the international coordination should promote. Uh, we are including the uh, carbonaceous cells or no but we are not really sure <laughs> we are doing the right thing or not. And we are also including the indirect effect and things like that. And the indirect effect in our case is very large, so that without that we, we cannot really talk about the uh, 20th century production or anything. But we are not really sure we are doing the right thing or not. So by sort of comparison of the different uh, simulations, uh, in some ways, the issue of understanding why models agree or disagree by doing intercomparisons has been something that was a natural thing to promote within WCRP because it's a research program in which climate, understanding of climate, climate, climate change and modeling of it is the main driver. Whereas the IPCC process has been one in which projections that can, that can be used by policymakers, I think, has been one of the main drivers. But there's obviously an overlap between those two, and uh, the question, I guess, one of the questions is how much of that overlap should motivate what's done here as opposed to what's done within the WCRP. I mean, now that we have this possibility that WCRP will get involved in, in this IPCC process uh, more intimately. Um, this may be a that might be relevant to how we uh, yeah, deal with the that model yeah. evaluation, but under model understanding maybe rather than modeling. Yeah, related question I have was the guy uh, talked about uh, mentioned about the uh, data simulation approach of uh, chemistry or aerosol or whatever. And there are people who want to identify the sources of uh, aerosols or sources of carbon dioxide and things like that. And such kind of activity, initial value kind of uh, data model uh, synthesis kind of activity. And uh, probably Jerry uh, uh, Shupra is uh, talking about, uh, he, he talked about the seamless prediction, but uh, uh, in, in his intention, there may be some uh, inclusion of the, the concept that uh, model and data should be more uh, synthesized uh, to, 
how to say, uh, organized uh, validation activity might be promoted. That that's kind of uh, IPCC or WGCM kind of uh, group uh, t tended to be more si simulation oriented. Uh, but uh, there are uh, slightly uh, overlapping, maybe, but a slightly different kind of group that uh, they are trying to identify the processes uh, uh, by comparison or through the use use of the uh, observation satellite data and so on. Uh, such, uh, I say, uh, uh, more process oriented or observation oriented activity and uh, this sort of uh, uh, simulation projection type of the activity might uh, be, you know, uh, make uh, closer that, that, that kind of uh, uh, I say uh, ori orientation or whatever might be suggested, I suppose. I think that's an ongoing process whereby you use a number of studies to improve your model and then that model will go into the IPCC. It's happening in every group. I think also this stuff about data simulation and uh, inverse modeling and so on is really still a very research type thing. At the present time, we are not really able to do that, you know, online to get CO2, methane, or CO emissions. No. We are very far, far away from there. First, there is not enough data, not always the right data. And uh, so I guess for the next IPCC, at least, we, c we use this data to improve a bit the inventories, but at the present time, we do cannot use that on the process of making the models and so on. Might be in the AR20 or something so like that. Your feeling is that uh, that kind of activity is uh, yes. uh, well promoted, but uh, right now, IPCC oriented uh, line of research and the process oriented line of research may be uh, slightly separated or the, yeah. uh, going the wrong way? I no, not the wrong <laughs> way. I think I at think the present time, this stuff about inverse modeling data simulation is, is still very research oriented stuff. and. When we talk about uh, this uh, uh, IPCC runs, we really need to have stuff that are really working well and well evaluated and so on. It's my feeling at least, I don't know. Yeah, in the short term. Yes. In short term, yes, yeah, but, but we are talking about the next run. IPCC, I mean. For the next IPCC, yes, but for the next, next after yeah. the next, maybe, but for the next one, I have, I have some doubts about it. Yeah. Some of the audience of the IPCC activity might, may have uh, some skepticism that uh, repeating this sort of uh, projection experiment, uh, they, they may have, uh, you know, uh, how to say, a concern that the, uh, if they are really uh, coming closer to the truth of nature or whatever. So uh, that, that, that's why um, there are a group of people who try to promote uh, the in interconnected activity between uh, WCRP and IPCC, I think. So. Well, I guess my other response is I know AIMS, for example, has efforts going on in these areas, and maybe WGCM does, but maybe that's not what this group is, you know, <laughs> what we're focused on. We can't do everything. So I, I also think it, yeah, my response, my personal response which has nothing to do with the group consensus is that maybe we shouldn't take that doing inverse modeling and data simulation on in this, in this way. Yeah, that's a pretty hard problem, isn't it? Having, and really, really to do it right, there's a lot of information you need that isn't there. That's right. That's the main, that's one of the main uh, limitations. So then this you're going to have to fudge it in somehow. Mm -hmm. That may add to the uncertainty rather than reduce it. Uh, so you know, maybe it's somewhat counterproductive uh, to you know. It's a good research question as to how. Yeah, to there is not that. much point at trying to do something like data simulation now. Um, there's just not enough data, yeah. and once once we have more data, then it would be a useful tool. But I'd say it's. Uh, I, I don't see it coming. I mean, even satellite observations of aerosols. The information that you get from there is is of just very limited use. So, so it, it's. I think at the present time, what we try to use that is for not for the climate trend, but for really the forecasting. 
at the present time. Well, the goal is really to have something ready for forecasting in 2008 or something like that, 2009. And which means that it's not one year, it's really a few days. For now, it's the goal of that. And then after that, we'll see. But uh, for the next five years, I guess, the goal is really to implement all that in the in the meteorological that, that's system. That's really uh, very differ different from our situation. We uh, we have a very limited number of modeling researchers in, in also chemistry and GCMs. Therefore, uh, everybody has to do uh, everything. <laughs> so uh, in my case, uh, in order to get aerosol people involved in uh, 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 global warming projects, I have to say something like this uh, to say that you can use uh, satellite data and you can use a regional model uh, to validate your uh, computation scheme and uh, try to uh, do the, uh, the yeah, uh, which we will work for the satellite and so on. They, they also do this kind of thing. And then they, they come <laughs> to talk to us. And then uh, as a part of their job, they could uh, validate uh, the GCM parameter, the aerosol parameterization. So that, uh, that, that kind of uh, involvement of such kind of work, inversion, they don't do inversion yet, but uh, such uh, satellite uh, data uh, thing was uh, necessary for, for us to get the people involved. So that may be slightly different. Uh, but I mean, uh, no, I think it's not different because you heard Olivier say he does that, his group does that also as part of their model development effort. And I, our group does that also. So we have, validation stuff for it's, validation. It's part of building a model, but it doesn't, but this is sort of, an, uh, well, I guess, you know, we have to rem remember or restate why we're here or what we think we're no, okay, trying to accomplish. Maybe, but it isn't. It may not be the topic I'm right. um, uh, talking about in this. So, what when are it we comes trying to the IPCC to simulation, you've got to make an expert judgment whether your model component is robust enough to go into the main model. So maybe we could come back to that. Uh, discuss how much complexity how much complexity we think is necessary for the sort of scientific questions we would like to answer. Um, I think I wrote here, that here. somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much complexity and practicability. For instance, bulk bulk aerosol versus the the modern <laughs> approach, which is about Twenty-five, yeah, twenty-five millimeters. Okay. At, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. at the most. Okay. Oh, well, well, if you go with the seven, yeah. seven modes. Twenty-five on this is yeah, something like fifteen here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that what you would call size segregated as well? I mean, some people use bins and. Yeah. Well, you've got, you, you can yeah, you specify the size number. distribution or several or sizes, or size size distributions, then you overlap mm -hmm. them. And you put aerosols in some of them, and then they're both size segregated. They're both size segregated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can tell you that. Hadley Center is doing for that approach for AR5. We are developing that, but we don't think we are at a stage where we can include it in AR5. We won't have done all the tests that we wish to do. So we we, we stick stick to. We the call this our interim model. And then this is where we would like to be. Well, I, I think a lot of people are doing aerosols are heading in that same direction. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, and of course, if they wanted to talk to each other to see if they're all, if they can learn from each other, they would like to have some forum and some process by which they could compare their model. That forum already exists. And that Aerocom, exists in the context of Aerocom, yeah. uh, which has been, per how many models have been involved in our comps so About far? 10. Oh, no, 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 no. 20. No. <laughs> 20. And so should we ask Ericom no. to produce the historical and future? So, uh, uh, I don't think they don't have the skill set to do that. They're, I mean, they might have produced a pre-industrial emission inventory, but they got it from somebody But else. is it a good, is the mechanism of Ericom a good constraining mechanism, a good mechanism to promote for Models that are developing, say, aerosol treatments. Yeah, I, I think and, so. You know, it's, it's, there's always some logistical issues around those things. And so, 
So next week at the AC and C meeting, I mean, the, the first thing to say to this group is just, this was just supposed to be a small group of people who decided, well, like, is there really a problem worth working on? And if so, how do we make it happen? And then, and so part of it will be to, we brought people from Aerocon and brought people from the Accent program and CCM Valve together, and we're trying to say, okay, what what do you, what are you not already doing that we ought to be doing to help out that effort? But I still don't see in any of the communities that are coming to that meeting or in this group of here whether we have this capability of getting the information that we need from that group over there to allow us to do the pre-industrial through present day. You mean in terms of uh, uh, of in terms of natural emissions? Exactly. Or okay. in terms of land use, or in terms yeah, of yeah, because it, in or terms of anthropogenic emissions, I, I think we have the information. But it depends when you want to do the bio the natural emissions. It's not only for aerosol, but for gases, it's the same. And most what most people have done up to now, for example, for hydrocarbons, they have used the same uh, ecosystem distribution, and they just run to different models like that. But if you can get uh, a good uh, distribution of PFTs and stuff like that, for the past, you can get both the fires and uh, maybe the fires, but the uh, nitrogen oxides and you can get uh, hydrocarbons, I guess you can get to aerosols. But it's for us to tell them exactly what we want. Do we want PFTs? Do we want uh, ecosystems with another way of distributing? But I think the models Maybe it's not the right group for that, but pe some people know how to do that. You tell Alex Gunder and Christine Vinnie Mayer to do it for that. You, you give her, we have already started to look at that. But the problem where we are really, uh, where we are really a problem is to get a good distribution of ecosystem for the pre-industrial period. And uh, so this, but this is a good opportunity, and maybe with the other groups, to really tell them what we need. But we need to agree, agree on what we want also. But, uh, I think for hydrocarbons it might be much more simpler than any than in than for other species because all the models are currently now based on what Alex Günther has done. The, all, all the vegetation models are based on one principle, which is almost used by everybody. For NOx emission, it might be very difficult. I would, I would say NOx surface emissions it might be a, it might be a total mess for our source. So I guess that's. Yeah. Why we're just coming back to this issue again and again? That Maybe it's not really uncertain, exists. but okay. have to be the defined. Inputs, uh, it's not uncertain. Less, it's as yeah. they have to be defined more clearly. I'm not sure it's uncertain, but we have to agree on what we want from the other group. Because all, not all models use the same data. It's That's fine. fine. Uh, it's not uncertain. Uncertain. We don't have the knowledge of the driving input that we would like. And if you go, for instance, for a model approach here, you certainly want emissions not only in mass, but also in number. And that doesn't really exist. Yeah, that's, that's what we sort of... Same for our for We stop here because we, we keep on coming back to this experimental design because we sort of have the feeling that even for we've got the model, we don't really know how to drive them over the historical period of the future. I would say exactly the same for hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. Because for hydrocarbons, we very easily get total hydrocarbons in mass. But the problem is the mass of an hydrocarbon model doesn't care. And we don't know how to transfer that to, to molecules. Because we don't know what the average mass of the hydrocarbons are. And this is the same problem. Well, it's probably a problem that the carbon cycle people don't really have. Because it's much easier to drive, yeah. to drive a model than virus of chemistry. But the question we can ask is, do we need, maybe for aerosol, but for hydrocarbons, do we need to have the details for, I mean, for this kind of models? Or can we just live with percentage, as it was done in AR3? Like, you have total hydrocarbons, and you say 3% is ethane, 2% is propane, stuff like that. I have the feeling that we can still live with that for the future. But... Well, yeah, but if, but if we can, if they can bring information, additional Yeah, if we can get it, yeah. One of the things which we talked about a little bit is whether people believe that it would be useful. Yeah. Everybody ought to always have the opportunity to, to, to do things the best way that they know how. 
but maybe it's also worthwhile trying to frame problems in terms of common emissions, for example, also, or common concentrations, fixing concentrations of species we don't, we're not prepared to, to represent, the, or, or to, to try and forecast for climate change, or the vertical distributions of, of aerosols. So maybe, maybe that's one thing we should, we should address before we, not necessarily today, but maybe tomorrow morning, or maybe in the experimental design mm -hmm. at times where we agree that it would be. I do want to work now, but it's, it's, a, it's a quarter past five. Shall I sit with Claire and try to put some in some memory, and then we... We show it on the, on the screen tomorrow and then we discuss it further. Yeah, good. You mean yeah. during the second part of this yeah. break? Perfect. Yeah. I, I think this two pronged approach is the most realistic to give modeling groups something in common to do and then also encourage them to do what they think is best. For, and, and then the question comes down is how do you derive the common thing that they're supposed to do? How do you come up with that? And for aerosols, it's a big issue. Especially the aerosols that don't have emissions, like sulfate emissions from IPCC. The other aerosols, it's much tougher. Yeah. There is a possibility, I guess, there, there could be some kind of effort such as uh, Amy Brands for chemistry or, and or aerosols. And it, because we, we do have some observational record that goes back probably about 20 years. And that's probably, it's also when we know emissions the, the best. And so that could be the kind of effort that groups could be interested in, in doing. By, and, and they could be, as, as you were talking about, forcing as many things just like Forcing SSTs, you can force having distribution of aerosols and along the vertical everywhere, or or just move to the uh, um, just the emissions, and and have something like CCM Val um, help design what kind of observations and what kind of tools you can use to uh, to evaluate models. The thing is, we can't ask the modeling groups to do six different types of comparisons from six different groups mm -hmm. because they're going to lose interest in doing yeah, that's right. So, right. Well, shall we quit for tonight and start again tomorrow morning? 8.30. 8.30. 8.30. 8.30. 8.30. 8.30. 8.30. 8.30. 8.30. 8.30. 8.30. 8.30. 8.30. 8.30. 8.30. 8.30. 8.30. 8.30.